So a carbon credit needs to be verifiable. So CDR, carbon removal needs to actually have happened and this, this needs to be able to be shown. Um, so that means it needs to be quantified either through, for instance, soil sampling or other ways of estimating uh, or measuring um, the carbon being taken out of the atmosphere and stored permanently. Along with that goes the second parameter, which is uh, meant to say um, a carbon removal credit, high quality one, needs to be net negative. So it needs to account from a life cycle perspective for all emissions that have gone into creating this, uh, this carbon removal credit. Those need to be accounted for. And at the end, there is a net value of carbon removal. Um, and there's two other ones that uh, I, I, I'll only touch on uh, briefly. One is that there is no carbon leakage, meaning that because you are moving one ton here doesn't mean that that ton is emitted or uh, not removed at, at a different point. And then um, high quality carbon removal uh, credits also account for and are very cognizant about benefits and risks that come associated with that credit. And now let's come to the two more tricky bits. Uh, and those typically are also the ones that regardless of whether we talk MBS or other solutions are ones that you know buyers need to be very cognizant about. One is additionality. Basically meaning that the climate benefit uh, of that carbon removal would not have happened without the financing through the carbon credit. Um, and to a degree, I mean, you could argue that regenerative agriculture or nature-based solutions are sort of the victim of their own greatness to, to, to a sense here because they carry so many other great benefits that could lead someone to adopt the practices without the carbon credit. So you need to credibly show that there were barriers in place that would have kept you, a farmer or someone uh, in forestry, from adopting the practices that led to the carbon. And then the other one is permanence, um, because the effect of CO2 in the atmosphere lasts for several hundreds of years, we only also need to make sure that the CO2 we take out of the atmosphere is kept out of it for an extended period of time. And in the nature of nature-based solutions, um, there is some risk of reversal. So you could also talk about durability because that, that accounts for this risk of reversal. On a high level, I think if one is looking for, for high quality carbon removal from nature-based solutions, those would be the parameters that I would keep a close eye on um, to, to be addressed in whatever carbon removal is issued. You know, for additionality, there are some um, Establish procedures, right, to determine if uh, carbon finance indeed did drive forward the activity. And some of those include a, a, a common practice assessment. So doing a scan of what is the current penetration of a practice or set of practices that is to be adopted uh, in a project. And if there's high penetration, um, <clears throat> that could be indicative of, you know, that the activity already on its own is um, is viable. Uh, so that's that's a good way to, to kind of check um, and is usually a core element of additionality. Then there are uh, barrier analyses that can be done. I think uh, Marianne also mentioned this, um, certainly financial barriers, right? Investment barriers that might be needed to adopt the, the technology, um, purchase equipment, purchase inputs. Um, these can be all barriers to, to uptake and then there are some other approaches um, on additionality that I can mention, some sort of newer emerging approaches, for example, a performance benchmark, where you would look at the distribution of performance around a metric like uh, soil organic carbon stock change, and um, then set a threshold for crediting and or additionality. So, you know, the, the, the project would have to exceed that threshold to um, be determined additional. and you know, there, there are advantages to kind of this performance benchmark approach, but they are very data intensive, right? To understand that you know, and that distribution to set the metric. Yeah, that's what I'll say on additionality on permanence. Um, absolutely, very important to, to look at non-permanence risk. Um, so at Vera, we have um, what we call a non-permanence risk tool um, to, uh, to be used at the, outset of a, a project uh, development effort. And that tool results in a risk score, um, which then determines allocation of a certain amount of credits into a, a pooled buffer account. This is essentially kind of a, a pooled insurance against future loss so that 
if a reversal does occur, if the farmer does till, let's say, or drop out of a project, um, then those buffer credits can be canceled to compensate for that loss. So that's an important mechanism that the, the BCDS program kind of pioneered. Why do people buy nature-based credits in general is there's an implicit need already for these co-benefits. You could otherwise just buy, let's say, the cheaper renewable energy credits from the easier projects if it's just about the ton of carbon is a ton of carbon narrative. So I think there is an implicit uh, valuation uh, of co-benefits and off-takers ask for these co-benefits. I also believe that carbon is not carbon storage is not the end goal it's uh, uh it's part of the solution um so um it's just the one that has a liquid market attached to it so that's why we use it and that's why there's so because it is quantifiable because it actually relates to something that we have set targets on it, it has a monetary value and therefore it's very easy to use, but it's not the metric to rule them all. The quantification of these non-carbon benefits, that's where it starts. And there is already quite a lot of uh, interest in that and uh, um, being done. Um, so we definitely support that. It's something our clients actively ask for. It's not something you can actually make liquid right now uh, um, and monetize, except in the premium that's paid for the credit.